This presentation is about improving performance of network requests. It's been known for years that latency of network interactions has large impact in many business areas. For example, internet retail, with Amazon showing the correlation between latency and online sales revenue, or Google now including performance of page speed in the ranking algorithm, or companies willing to invest hundreds of millions of dollars to reduce latency just by a few milliseconds. And over the last year, all of us directly felt the growing importance of data interactions over the internet on our day-to-day -day lives. When one thinks of latency in scope of Netflix business, video streaming naturally comes to mind first. And for good reason. Over 10% of all downstream traffic on the internet is Netflix video streaming. To make it performant and efficient, Netflix has built and scaled one of the most well-connected content delivery networks, or CDN, in the world. This network is called OpenConnect and is used today to deliver pretty much all of the Netflix's static content like videos or images. This data is delivered from servers called OpenConnect appliances. They use a combination of hardware components and software optimizations to deliver content with incredible efficiency. These servers are deployed in thousands of locations all around the world, embedded into ISP networks or placed into Internet Exchange locations. The Internet Exchange locations are itself connected together via the private Open Connect Backbone network. This network also connects CDN servers to a control plane in the Amazon cloud. This powerful infrastructure has been deployed and optimized for best streaming delivery over 10 years and is one of the core building blocks of smooth Netflix streaming experience. You can find plenty of great talks online described in more detail. But network dependencies for Netflix service are not limited to video streaming. Before a user starts the stream, they need to choose a title to watch. And for that, they interact with the content discovery experience within Netflix UI. These experiences also depend on data delivered over the network. However, these interactions are heavily personalized for each user, with data provided by a collection of services running in the Amazon Cloud infrastructure. And today, Netflix Cloud infrastructure runs on three Amazon regions. In those regions, hundreds of microservices work together to provide this personalized metadata sent to UIs on user devices. And from user measurements, Netflix knows that delays to get this personalized data from cloud endpoints may contribute quite significantly to user perceived delays when they interact with the Netflix UI. For example, calls to AWS services can take up to 40% of user wait time to render the home page on Android. With that in mind, Netflix engineers were faced with an interesting question. Would it be possible to leverage various distributed CDN edge infrastructure to improve performance of network requests between user devices and cloud infrastructure in the AWS? Standard HTTP caching techniques wouldn't work because personalization makes these interactions practically non-cacheable. And while there are many options that involve large UI architecture, the ideal solution would minimize disruption to device and server teams so they could focus on delivering product features. And ideally, the system itself would be easy to maintain, no matter how distributed it is. My name is Sergey Fedorov. I'm a director of engineering on the content delivery team at Netflix. And today, I'm going to present how Netflix has solved this problem. First, I'm going to explain how to leverage distributed CDN edge infrastructure to accelerate network requests between devices and data centers. Then I'm going to describe in detail Netflix's solution, all the way from the concept to deployment and to operations of the system. And lastly, I'm going to highlight what all of you can learn from our experience to make sure that your network requests can fly through the internet as quickly as possible. Let's begin. First, let's talk about some fundamentals of network acceleration. As a reminder, in our case, we have three regions in the cloud, but we have clients all around the world. And we have way more distributed CDN edge infrastructure across thousands of locations, generally quite a bit closer to, to users. As a reminder, due to personalization, we cannot position the content on the CDN servers. But what if we route the request from the client to the cloud via the closest CDN server, via the proxy on that server? Can it be faster? In order to explain the answer to that question, let me get back to some of the networking 101. 
In order for the client to start getting the data from the server, it needs to first establish a TCP and TLS connections. And that time depends on the round trip time or RTT between client and the terminating server. In, that, in the situation when the latency is 100 milliseconds, it will take at least 200 milliseconds to establish a connection and another 100 milliseconds to start passing useful data from the server to the user, to the total of 300 milliseconds. Now, if we install a CDN server in between with a proxy that terminates that connection, and let's say it's 30 milliseconds away, the overhead of establishing a connection is only being paid on a shorter segment of the path, and we only travel the full 100 milliseconds of latency once to get useful data. As a result, the total latency to start getting the data gets reduced to 160 milliseconds, quite a bit lower. But the benefits do not stop at the connection establishment. Because when the data is already flowing, if there is any loss on the network, which could be quite common on wireless networks, the recovery from that loss depends again on the round trip time between the client and the terminating server. Then between CDN edge server and the cloud, we could leverage our private backbone network and we can configure specific rules to prioritize latency sensitive traffic and help avoid the congestion on the internet. And then we can also multiplex several requests from the client on the same connection between CDN edge and origin server, further leveraging more benefits of network link. On one side, this is all networking fundamentals. But from the user perspective, this can look like magic because we are managing to make data fly faster without changing anything on the client or on the server side. It may appear like we define the laws of physics. That's why we decided to call this project Faster Than Light. Now with a strong theory and a cool sounding name, all what's left to do is to launch this project in production, right? Not so fast. At Netflix, proving your case with theory is not enough, because we know that reality may bring you many surprises, especially when you operate at Netflix scale. Which meant that for our project, we had to validate the improvements promised by the theoretical background with real-world data. So we had to go and invest into building the network measurement system. For that measurement system, our ultimate goal is to understand the patterns of connectivity between our users and origin servers. In a way, we wanted to build the latency map on the internet, the one that we could then use to validate the performance of different routing options for our requests. And for that system, the critical part is to have estimates for our users using our Netflix devices across the full range. And of course, we want to do it as quickly as possible and do it in a way that minimizes the risk to our production systems. First, we look at available options, one of which is to use real user monitoring, where you observe the performance of network requests for your production traffic. It's nice because you get the full coverage of all locations and devices for your users. However, you can only test the production path. So in order for us to test the performance of our CDN edge proxy, we would have to productize it first. An alternative is to use synthetic monitoring, where you have a test service in the lab, where you can test any server and any path you want. You have full control, However, building a lab representing all of the locations and devices for Netflix users is pretty much impossible. So we built Probnik, a synthetic measurements platform running on user devices. It consists of an agent that we call a probe that gets deployed alongside of the Netflix UI and allows us to run the controlled network experiments. The way it works, at some moment, ideally with little network activity in the UI, the probe makes a call to the control plane in the cloud and gets the test configuration that we call a recipe. Recipe specifies a, test, a set of targets that the client needs to download a specific set of information from and measures how long that request takes. And that then reports a result to analysis. There is more information available about Probnik online with the former presentations or at the Netflix GitHub open source page. Now, once we have a measurement system, it's time to build a prototype for our CDN Edge proxy. For the prototype, our guiding principle was simplicity. So we went with a Go-based proxy, choosing Go for the power of its networking library and ability to deploy it as a static binary. So we could just drop it on our CDN server, open the port and start routing traffic. But then we also have to figure out how to connect 
devices with one of the thousands of edge servers. And if for their cloud service selection, we've used GeoDNS to choose one of the AWS regions for each user, Geo wouldn't work so well for our CDN edge. So we went with TCP Anycast, where we configure a single IP address for all of the servers on the CDN and let client be connected to one of them using the network distance. Now for each client, we have two options, going to the cloud directly or being proxied over the CDN edge proxy. And the question is which path is faster, and that's where we're using our probing system to measure the performance. For each user, we are asking them to send two requests. Download the same piece of data from the cloud over a direct path, or have this, the request go via the CDN edge proxy, and compare the time. Then we aggregate it over all users and use this visualization to look at the results. On the horizontal scale, we're looking at different uh, regions where users are located. And the horizontal scale, we are looking at the percentage of acceleration that proxy gives compared to our control experience with the clients going to the cloud directly. The intensity of the color showed the number of users achieving the specific percentage of acceleration for the request compared to, to control. Ideally, we'd like to see all the users to the right of the red dotted line, meaning that we have equal or faster experience. However, on this heat map, we see a good number of users to the left of, the, of that line, meaning that for, for them, the proxy actually results in a slower experience. And this is not what we want to have. We don't want to have a compromise. We don't want to make performance worse for some users to make others faster. At this point, we learned that the solution purely based on CNH proxying wouldn't work for our users. We got to this point using quick prototyping, we're quite confident in our data, and most importantly, we didn't risk anything in production. And yet, we were not ready to give up on the idea. So we went back to the drawing board, and one thing that we've learned from the first prototype is that many users had much faster performance with our proxy, but not all of them. So what if we could intelligently choose the most optimal path, depending on the user, depending on their connectivity? In other words, we'll have to route or steer them intelligently. And we'll have to do that decision without making any API calls to the cloud, because that's where we try to send traffic to. And we still wanted to maintain the easy integration with the client, so no complex logic. When we look at available options, DNS came to mind. DNS converts the hostname used by the device to the IP address the device needs to connect to. So what if we plug into that process and either return an IP address of the AWS server for the direct path, or the TCP Anycast IP for their CDN proxy path. One complication with DNS is that authoritative DNS server, the one that does the conversion between hostname and IP address, doesn't have visibility all the way to the client. Instead, it only sees the IP address of the recursive resolver that is configured by the user, which means that we'll have to make a routing decision for the groups of users sitting behind the same recursive resolver. In order to do that, we'll still use the same testing recipe with our probe, where we have two paths measured between the users and the cloud, one going directly to the cloud, another one using the proxy. Then we'll aggregate the latency measurements and group them by the resolvers. And then for each resolver, we'll have to make a single decision to route all of the users for that resolver either over the proxy path or going to the cloud directly. This map is built based on the resolver IP and is then loaded onto authoritative DNS server, which then uses that map to route the future requests by responding with the IP address based on the map decision. So what we've done is we've built this control loop where we are looking at the data collected from the users, latency measurements, that are then being sent to the cloud, going through the data pipeline, where the results are aggregated per resolver and then the map is loaded onto our DNS infrastructure, which is then may, uh, used to make the decision for production traffic. This is the idea. Of course, we had to measure whether this would work. And that's where we use the probing again. At this time, we're using a different recipe where we compare our control users going to the cloud directly with the users following the decision made by our DNS steering. Then we're comparing the results from all users and looking at the results in the same visualization that we've used before. 
And that's the case where we see the picture that we want to see. All of the users are to the right side of the red dotted line, meaning that we either significantly accelerate the network performance or keep the performance the same as it was. And that's the picture that we want to see, and that's the reason to celebrate. At this point, we found a solution that works. It's based on DNS, doesn't require any complicated changes on the device's server side, and produces faster network experience for majority of our users without a compromise. We've been able to test and evolve the system using quick prototyping and analysis based on data from our users. And as we've been doing that, we didn't have to change anything in production, minimizing negative user impact. To some of you, it may seem like the hard part is done. In reality, things were just getting started, as we had to roll out the system in production. What we had to do is to change routing of millions of requests per second carrying data critical for Netflix service. That data is coming from more than 200 million users across thousands of types of different devices. This request would be dynamically routed over tens of thousands of CDN edge locations on the way to the cloud infrastructure. While that is being deployed, hundreds of device and server engineers keep evolving the Netflix services with dozens of changes per day. If that's not enough, the faster than light space force consists of only three team members who would have to build, deploy, and maintain that system. In order to be successful, we had to focus on a few things. First, we had to dress well. Second, we had to embrace failure as a core component of our architecture. When operating over a distributed edge infrastructure, it's better to expect that something is going to break. So we focused on minimizing the scope of each failure, and when it happened, failing gracefully. In a nutshell, Integration of our request acceleration system was quite simple. Make devices use a different DNS hostname that would follow our intelligent routing decision. But in addition to that, we asked to implement a fallback mechanism where clients would monitor connectivity errors over the accelerated path and, at the signs of consistent failures, switch to the default path. That system allowed us to move faster, to be more risk tolerant when making changes while still protecting us if we missed any edge case condition during our synthetic testing. And yes, despite all of our efforts, we did discover a few edge cases that we missed. Of course, we didn't blindly rely on a fallback only. We still followed all of the best deployment practices, making small changes, testing them with a probing system first, then proceeding with an A-B test or canary to catch any edge conditions, and then going with a progressive rollout to catch any potential capacity concerns. Once we rolled out this faster than light acceleration system, our job was still not over. We still had to operate it. And as I mentioned, when you operate on a distributed infrastructure having thousands of points of presence, depending on the global internet network, issues are going to come. We didn't want to spend most of our time troubleshooting these issues, especially the ones that can be avoided automatically. We realized that in addition to using user-based probes as a network performance signal, we can also use it to route around outages. For that, we would still be relying on the same client-based probe configuration that we used to observe network performance over different network paths to the cloud. But instead of looking at network latency, this time we focus on reachability. Having visibility into user connectivity over various network paths allows us to detect the type of network failure and then distinguish between cases when only one network path is affected, meaning that it's still possible for a user to reach its destination. Like this example, when ISP loses connectivity to AWS region only. Or another example of a failure of our backbone link. In these cases, the appropriate response is to change the user path, have them follow an alternate route that is still reachable. In other cases, like a failure of a last mile link, there is no routable path for the user and there is literally not much our team can do to help. As we didn't want to be overwhelmed with individual failures of widely distributed network, we integrated the reachability signal into our request routing. For that, in addition to considering performance of network requests, we would also look at errors and automatically reroute users over the path that's still reachable, if there is one. The response of our request steering pipeline is 5 to 15 minutes, which could still be a problem. But that's where our client fallback process comes handy again, failing gracefully and maintaining user connectivity. 
It may only result in slightly slower experience for a few minutes, while significantly reducing operational overhead for our team. To recap, to travel faster than light, we rely on hundreds of thousands of synthetic measurements performed on user devices. That data is then aggregated in the cloud data pipeline, where we determine the most optimal network path across 200,000 segments at DNS resolver granularity. The output of that model is then used by DNS to route millions of production requests per second. HTTPS requests on new connections are accelerated by 25% and on existing connections by 10% on median. The system is built, deployed, and maintained by a small team of three engineers. It required minimal amount of changes on the device and server side to deploy, and operationally, it's mostly hands-off. Let me guess. Some of you may be thinking, optimizations like that are great for companies like Netflix. But what if I don't have a CDN or a private backbone? What if I don't run my own DNS service? What can I learn from that? And my answer to you is that you can still learn quite a bit. Majority of what I've talked about, the process, the workflow, the mindset can still easily be applied in your domain, at most with some minor modifications. Even if you don't run your own infrastructure, you have plenty of choices. There are many cloud vendors, hosting providers, or CDN edge networks. My point is, as you think of evolving your data delivery infrastructure of your net network architecture, question your intuition and question marketing claims. Make your decisions based on data collected from your users and on metrics that are relevant for your application. It doesn't limit you to only network routing. As a matter of fact, the same team of three engineers that was working on DNS-based steering solution tested and evolved dozens of other network improvements, starting from testing new application protocols like HTTP2 to playing with different transport protocol options or rebalancing how we send traffic to Amazon regions or migrating to the D different DNS provider. The key to the team efficiency is a short loop that allows us to measure different ideas with the data collected from devices without touching production. For the DNS steering system that I've described, it took us less than six months to iterate and on different prototypes and come up with the final solution that we knew is going to work. And, and it took less than six months, including building the measurement system. Then it took us over two years to productize it because productization takes time and it's also risky. As you productize your ideas, think about failures first. Because when you deal with networks, and especially operate over a distributed edge infrastructure, something is going to break. And you probably don't want to be in the middle of it. For our team, despite managing millions of requests per second of critical Netflix traffic, running dozens of experiments, changing the network configuration, the team receives less than one pager per week. The secret to that is embracing the failure as part of our architecture, having the fallback, failing gracefully. To recap my talk, I encourage you to invest into your network insights workflow, follow the data-driven process to evolve your data delivery architecture, have operational mindset, get ahead of failures by automating response as much as possible, and keep learning every step of the way. I believe that following this workflow would make your network request fly through the internet faster than you could ever imagine, make your day-to-day -day operations free from fire drills, and your customers delighted with a smooth user experience free from network delays. I hope that you found the learnings and experiences at Netflix useful. If you want to learn more or share your story, you can always find me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Thank you for listening and happy networking. Thanks for the talk, awesome. Always love learning more about networking and I really like the call out to experimentation. That is key to success in many areas of life, right? So fantastic talk, fantastic. We have got a lot of questions to, to go through. Um, I'll throw a couple out, then I'll keep uh, reading the chat. So if you've got more questions, folks watching, please put them in the chat and, and I'll pass on to Sergey. And there's a hangout afterwards as well if we do wanna uh, go a bit longer. So I know there was only three of you, Sergey, and I am loving the outfits you showed there, very stylish, right? Um, I know there's only three of you, but you mentioned it took over two years to fully productize this. What was the main challenges that, that sort of made it take this long? 
Um, I think the, the main difference is that while we are prototyping and proving that the concept would work, it was primarily concerning only that three folks that were in the picture, meaning that we could iterate pretty quickly, fewer dependencies, like we could be really, like really focused on the core aspects of it. When you go into production, as you imagine, like I've, I've shown some of the stats, we have like millions of requests per second. We have uh, the CDN that we run on that is built for videos. And uh, like, that's a lot of traffic that's very critical. Um, first, in many ways, you have to explain and uh, make sure that all the risks are understood. Like just communication overhead is quite substantial. And in our case, we have at least four different client platforms. So the teams that write, write applications for iOS, for Android, for web, for TVs, those are completely different teams. They have completely mm -hmm. different code base. Uh, Every integration point, even though I mentioned like we, we had relatively lightweight integration, that's already quite a bit of work. And also understanding like what needs to be done. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that can uh, be lost in translation. Um, then as we are actually going and approaching the routing changes, uh, you have to think about stuff like provisioning and capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We are leveraging the backbone, and historically we build that backbone to preposition the video content on the CDN edge. Uh, I mean, and the, the way we do the preposition that I've shared the talk from Mohit and uh, Haley in the past, uh, oh, we yeah. mostly do it uh, during the off peak. And it's a relatively small amount of data, even though it's videos, but it's actually not that much in totals because we are pretty effective at placing that. Uh, and here, even though we're accelerating API requests, which are relatively tiny in size, yeah. in aggregate, there's actually a lot of traffic. We have to augment the backbone. And uh, when you augment the network, that's actually like every step is like months because you have yeah. to pre-order, you have to install it. Yeah. And, um, and, in, 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 before that, you have to do the modeling and properly understand which links have to be augmented. Uh, so those are just a few examples. Um, and then uh, there are some of the issues about load balancer and properly uh, identifying all of the search, like uh, I, I, like all of the ways how traffic gets into the cloud infrastructure. There are a few talks about Zool, which are our uh, edge gateway. Uh, there's quite a lot of nuances there that we have to go through. Um, and I imagine, yeah, you know, right now I've optimized the presentation for 25 minutes. Uh, you yeah. need to understand quite a bit more to properly uh, do that. Uh, so lots of communication, lots of understanding, lots of learning. And uh, yes, it does take time. What really helps yeah. us is that we, we, we have that data we've just showed, hey, like this is what we have on the, in terms of improvements from real users. And that's what drives attention. And uh, without that, I'm not sure how long it would take because at Netflix, we run pretty lean. Um, and uh, teams always have to juggle multiple things they have to work on. Uh, in our case, we had a project and idea that was pretty promising from the data viewpoints, and it 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 also helped. Uh, even though two years might sound like a lot, <laughs> uh, it might not be that uh, long for the scale of it and for the yeah, for, for, for how many things it, it changed. Agree, Sergey, and the high risk situation. I totally get that as well. Yes, I saw a quite yes. great question from Alex along the way. Um, uh, do folks? Do end users opt into this? Are they like beta testers, or do you just use production traffic? Uh, we use production traffic. And uh, obviously, in that case, the, the, the first thing, I haven't called it out in the presentation, but the first step that everyone should do before they add extra measurements is to make sure that it doesn't harm users. And in that case, the first thing that we've done is that we had implementation of the prod. We had a very small scale test, and we just tested any quality of experience impact. And that's where we validated that we could, uh, we validate when and how many requests we can send mm -hmm. uh, without impacting any smoothness of the UI or uh, like the impact on the video streaming. And that's, with that, we had a specific limit of how many requests, how many tests we can oh, run nice. at any point of time. Very nice, very nice. Uh, I saw Christian's question pop up, and I saw you say we'll come to this in the Q&A because it's a great question. So Christian asks, uh, I did the same analysis in the past in terms of performance. Uh, nevertheless, in some countries, sometimes the IPs are being reused across multiple regions in the same country, which actually can impact the proxy, non-proxy approach. How did you solve this problem? Um, Generally, there are two things that are core to our solutions. First, that's where that's the part where TCP Anycast actually excels, because you are giving the user a single IP address, and uh, even though it appears like a single location, multiple users behind the same resolver can actually go to different servers based on the local connectivity. Uh, so that's one nice part of Anycast. 
the second part is that we are not limiting to our proxy solution. And uh, some of the negative aspects that we've showed when we are uh, seeing the degradation of experience might have come from those proxy solutions. Uh, there are multiple mm -hmm. reasons like why uh, like it wasn't always faster, but one of them could be that. At our scale, we physically don't have an ability to uh, investigate every single case. We, it just wouldn't scale. Uh, we may yeah. look at some of the patterns. Uh, but in that case, our solution was purely data-driven. We look at the latency. We are looking at the finer grain building block that we could use. And uh, we measure if it, if it works, if it gets to the acceleration, we're going with that. Uh, but in general, if for some reason the proxy really messes up with a proxy solution, we just would steer those users directly to, uh, to the cloud without leveraging CDN Edge. Nice, very nice. And another question from Michael. Uh, can you elaborate on what your DNS mapping looks like, how you compute it, and how is it loaded? Yeah. Uh, so I think in the nutshell, the DNS map is uh, a map between the resolver IP, so just a simple IP address uh, that authority DNS resolver sees, to the path. And uh, it's basically for each resolver, and I've uh, shared the number, we see about 200,000 or so uh, recursive resolvers that hit our infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, we map, like we map them to their decision, like to the IP address that we need to give. And it's either a TCP anycast address or it's uh, like a C name or like IP address of the AWS server. Uh, that's that's a, that's what we load onto the OS DNS. There's just kind of this key value pair, IP address, uh, destination. Uh, it's been computed. Uh, basically, we run the loop. So those latency measurements are on the devices continuously all the time. Oh, They're nice. feeding all of those measurements from all, 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 the, all over the world into the cloud. And then we have the data pipeline that's in real time, aggregates all of that uh, data into the resolver, makes a decision for which resolver, which path we should take. And then it goes and loads in, into our CDN. Uh, it's not instant, obviously. Uh, we currently have uh, reduced the latency of this whole loop to about like five, 10 minutes. Um, like we have a few ideas how we could make it faster, but in general, we are also trying to make data-driven decision. We are trying to see how many situations we are not capturing that. And uh, what the, because the lower latency you do, the more complicated and fragile the system becomes. And that's where it's beautiful that we have this fallback on the client side, that if for some reason, if something like happened within those five, 10 minutes before we had the chance to update the routing, clients would gracefully, uh, gracefully nice. fall back. Very nice, very nice indeed. You've answered one of my other questions there, which is great, super. Uh, Julian asks, oh, interesting one, this may be a separate talk actually, but could you identify if users are using a wireless network like LTE or 5G? Uh, is there any way to improve user experience if the bottleneck is a wireless network? Uh, I think there are probably two questions here. Uh, a, if we are purely talking about wireless network, then generally we can identify that. And uh, quite often they would use different uh, recur like recursive resolver infrastructure so we can sort of automatically uh, detect determine that. And, but in our case, we don't have a special treatment because it's purely latency based. Uh, and uh, our edge proxy is more likely to help for wireless networks. So it's more likely to prefer edge path if it's actually ah. faster. Uh, but I think the second answer, the, the second part of that question is the in-home wireless setup. So the, the link between the device and the router, uh, mm. like uh, contention on the Wi-Fi and stuff like that. Uh, well, like my microwave situation when someone turns on the microwave oh, and nice. we have an in, instantaneous bleep. Uh, yeah. So in our approach, we intentionally don't look for those situations because they those instant, instantaneous uh, like in-home situations uh, that yeah. are very unique for the time and the users, they would not benefit from our solution. Yeah. What we are looking for with our approach is the long-term connectivity patterns on the internet. Um, and uh, if we need to address to any instantaneous things, uh, likely we have to go with the client-based solutions. Right now, we are playing with uh, with some of the ideas how to, we can do a little bit smarter things on the client side uh, to uh, choose different paths. But generally, this is... It, this, this doesn't scale as nicely as our solution because then each client, like mm. each platform would have to do its own thing. It's that constant trade-off, right, between client and server. Yeah. I've seen many talks over the years with Netflix talk about that, which, yeah. is, which is fantastic. Uh, Byron asks, changing tack a little bit, uh, do you see in production uh, that clients using HTTP2 have clear advantages over HTTP 1.1 in terms of latency? Uh, well, that's one thing. That's one of the other things that we've tested. Uh, it's sort of orthogonal to the routing question uh, because mm -hmm. with HTTP two we're changing the protocol, we are not changing the route. Uh, 
Uh, but that's yes. where we, we use the probe link and our client side measurements for. Uh, we did see improvements to HTTP2. Um, it's not clearly uh, kind of one side or another. Uh, there are some mm -hmm. cases where HTTP helps more when you have multiple you know, requests, when you have longer distances, uh, all, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, but we also learned that there are some of the downsides of HTTP2. It could be a little bit more process intensive. And if you're running on the old uh, kind of hardware, old device, uh, it may be uh, Kind of ultimately resulting in the worst experience because oh, it intriguing. requires like to, it, it may be a little bit more memory intensive. It can be a little bit more compute intensive, both on the client and on the server side. Um, so yeah, that's it's we short question. We did see uh, yeah. short answer. We did see the network improvements of HTTP two. It's a little bit dependent on types of the patterns of interactions. If you only send one request, you'll see way less improvements of HTTP two versus. Uh, parallel request going from device to server. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you also have to uh, keep in mind the resource constraint in some uh, in some situations. That is something that we all forget, sort of not being in Netflix, in that you can be running on a mobile device or some really old television that's got Netflix built in, right? Yeah, yeah very well, interesting. Well, welcome to the world of 10 years old smart TVs <laughs> yeah. and Blu-ray players. It's, I can only fun. imagine the challenges. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That's fascinating. Fascinating. Um, uh, I'll, I'll finish with one uh, final question here. Um, Axel asks, and it's a nice roundup question, what was the ultimate problem that motivated you to carry out the project? Was it an idea that came up or was there a sort of real problem in production that that um, sort of came through Netflix teams? Um, the origin of that is uh, we we want to make sure that all of the U UI transitions are smooth, uh, and uh, we want to minimize any wait time for the users uh, caused by the network. There are obviously multiple ways how we can improve that, both with like device side kind of pre pre fetching all the all of those uh, things. But ultimately, we do have a global customer base. We have relatively localized cloud infrastructure, and even though we could kind of run in more data centers, ultimately the numbers, like we have thousands of edge locations and we could maybe have like a thousands of cloud regions that still um, kind of, you, you can't be the speed of light, even though my <laughs> presentation <laughs> talks about it. Uh, but yeah, generally we have, uh, we've, we, we've had a strong intuition and later we've had the current data that shows that interactions to the um, cloud is on a critical path, like basically it's in yep. the face of users. Yes. And uh, minimizing the data transfer would benefit that. And uh, that was the inspiration. In many ways, uh, we sort of have this infrastructure here and there. And we are, it was a logical way to leverage the very well distributed edge ecosystem uh, to, to do network optimizations. Sadly, we are, um, still have to go to the cloud because of heavy personalization. We cannot like do HTTP caching and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, but even here, as I've shared, uh, some of the wins and improvements that we've seen on data transfers, and those are millions. Like in some of the edge cases, like uh, regional or for specific closely networks, the improvements are like 50 60%, uh, especially if you establish a new connection. That is a great soundbite to end on, I think, Sergey. Are you going to hang around in the um, Hangout afterwards for a bit? Absolutely, yeah. I'll be happy to chat more. And obviously, if uh, there are more questions, I've shared some of my uh, contact information on Twitter or LinkedIn. Happy to keep the conversation going. Very much appreciate it, Sergey. Thank you again for the fantastic talk, fantastic questions, and fantastic answers. We'll see everyone again soon. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Thanks, Sergey.